Hello, uh, my name is Eric. I don't have any footer in the, my slides, so no problem, it's cutting footer. So uh, I'm from Brazil, I'm from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I'm CTO of a Brazilian company called Winning, which is basically a video platform, a video aggregator, but this is not your problem. <laughs> and today we go talk about microservice. And to talk about microservices, the first thing we need to know is what the problem with the current architecture, with monolithic architecture. So I will explain to you the problems with this architecture and what do we need to solve these problems? What kind of patterns do we need to solve these problems? After this, we'll see the definition and the benefits of microservices and how we can implement this in Node. And also I'll show you a video with uh, a microservice architecture running and some code. Okay. Monolithic applications are those where all services are running in the same process. And running the same process means that all your services are sharing the same machine resource, like memory, CPU, the whole process, and connections, and all these things. So if you have an infinite loop, that's what happens, or a database lock, or a memory leak, or in the case of Node, even a, even a single Node-treated exception, this is what happens. And this is what happens to you when any of these problems happens in your company. And the big problem of monolithic applications is the, the fact they are sharing the same process, they are sharing the same big code base. And because of this enormous code base, it's really hard to change your code without messing with other services. Uh, I think everybody here was in that same moment in your life where you just change your code in a service and the problem happens in another service completely non-related. And this is really common in monolithic applications. And they are also really hard to deploy and really hard to monitor because it's really hard to understand where the problem is, where is the bottleneck of your application when you don't have the right tools to, to understand your whole application with the certain granularity. So to solve these problems, and a bunch of people created what they call the reactive manifesto. The reactive manifesto is basically four patterns to achieve scalability and the modern requirement, which like uh, low response time, no downtime, and handling lots of data. And the first pattern is response. Uh, reactive systems, they are responsive, and being responsive means being capable of giving response in a constant and low time. This way, you have a better quality of service in your system. The second pattern is resilience. And this is a blue screen of death. <laughs> so a resilient system is those where uh, an error can happen, but it don't crash your system. A resilient system is capable of keeping responsive even in face of failure. You're capable of containing your error, and your system don't crash because a single error happened. The other pattern is elastic. That's the only place where I have footers. <laughs> You're losing the elastic here. So uh, elastic system is basically a system where you can divide and replicate parts of your system so you can handle with an increasing or decreasing workload with easy. And the last one, you always must use message passing when communicating your services. And message passing means being capable of receiving and deliver async messages and serializable messages so you can send it to, through the network to other services. And also, uh, system using message passing must be capable of using the same constructors when running in a single host or in a cluster. So you don't need to change your system to when you want to replicate and divide your system when you are using message passing. And the Good thing is microservices is basically an implementation of these four patterns. Martin Fallon defines uh, microservices as this. I will read with, with you. The microservice architecture style is an approach to developing a single application as a suite of small services, each running in its own process and communicating with lightweight mechanisms, often an HTTP resource API. These services are built around business capabilities and independently deployable by fully automated deployment machinery. There is a bare minimum of centralized management of these services, which may be written in different programming languages and using different data, store technologies. 
So basically, they are talking about message passing in elastic, responsive, and resilience here in this definition. The key concepts are basically uh, using small and independent service, using lightweight com communication, and using cats. No, kidding. Just I don't have a good picture for minimum management centralization, so I put a cat. <laughs> but you can use a cat. So what are the benefits of this architecture? The big, really big benefit of using this is no sharing resource. Sharing resource is evil. As is evil as evolve is evil. <laughs> so never share your resource. And independence between your service. So even if when a service crash, when a service fail, your whole system low needs to fail. You just lose parts of your system and your system can recover by itself. And as you have always small services, they are a lot easier to change and to test because a change just changed the, the, that service. And they are easy to deploy because they are independent and they are easy to monitor. So you might be asking yourself how we can implement this in Node. Now that you know what are the benefits of Microsoft's architecture, what are the problems with the monolithic architecture, how we can implement this Node? What do we need? What kind of structures we need to implement these patterns in Node. The first thing we need is a halter. A halter is basically an, ob an object responsible for message passing. A halter must be able to receive and deliver async messages. We also need immutability. And we need this because we need that a service can't mess with the internal state of an object used by another service. If you are planning to, to implement a really, really big system with thousands of, of service, we probably need a namespace solution to avoid name collision between your service, because you don't want your coworker using the same name in the service that you're using. And it would be like to have a plugins or add-ons or something like this, where you are capable to add new functionalities to your systems, like uh, measuring performance or retrying uh, on errors or these kinds of things, or even track better uh, an error. And trying to solve these problems, I created a framework called Studio. Studio was inspired by Akka. Akka is a framework from Scala, for those who know Scala, based on the called Actors model, which is also used by Erlang. I started this in 2014. And I started because I was working in the new big project from my company. I was the first employee of the, this company. And we wanted to create a, a system using the minimal amount of money, so we don't want to use a lot of machines. We don't want to distribute with thousands of services in, in, in a cluster. So we planned to create a system where we can easily just take some parts of the system to different machines as we grow. And this was the problem that I'm trying to solve. And I started this in 2014, and we used this in the, currently using it in the company yet. But I decided to recreate the full API in 2015 because the, the initial API was really, really inspired by the actor's model. So most of people just looked at the API and said, oh my god, what's going on? And now it's uh, re really easy to grasp, I'll show you. So what Studio does is basically enforces you to use the good practices. They enforce you to create your system following that four patterns that we discussed before. And these good practices are basically, but not just this, using async messages. All services call in, in Studio are async. Uh, using immutability, Studio always pass a clone of the object when calling other functions, and your code is always running inside a promise. So you don't have, it's really, really hard to have an exception going out of a promise. You have to do something really, really wrong <laughs> to get this. And we have a lot of plugins that I created to, to use Studio. One of the plugins is for clustering. So you can easily take a, a, a system using Studio and divide it, and with one or two lines of code, you can clusterize this, this system. They are also capable of gathering usage metrics for all your services with just one line of code. 
And you can add other things like timeouts, retries, and mock for tests. And you can also create your own with just a few lines of code. And how we can do clustering in Studio? When doing clustering, you have two problems. The first one is, where is the service that I need? So the first problem the plugin tries to solve is service discovery. And it can discover a service in two ways. If you are running in a local network, like your work network, you can use the network broadcast. That's the full way Studio Cluster uses to find other services. But if you are running on Amazon, uh, Amazon VPC don't support network broadcast. So you can use a Reds database uh, using the publisher subscribe uh, pattern. We can just discover, discover the other service. And we can use this to do the remote procedure call, which basically calling a service from another server. And we do this using a peer-to-peer -peer WebSocket based connection. Studio is also ES6 friendly, and I told you that I decided to recreate the API with focus on developer happiness. And for this reason, you can use generators. For those who don't know generators, uh, it's basically a sync await. We can do this in Studio. It works. We can use a proxy. So if you're just distributing your services across a cluster, you can call a service as it was a local service using a proxy. And you can use classes to create a namespace for a service. But one important thing is, uh, besides all these things that Studio can do, it's completely ES6, ES5, uh, I don't know how to say this in English. <laughs> you can use this on older versions of Node. You, you don't you need to use ES6. So you can run it on Node 0.10 or 11, and it works in most versions of Node. So I will show you some code. I, I plan to show you live code, but I didn't know if we would have internet connection, and I need internet, internet connection to show two different process running. So I recorded a video showing this communication. And before going into the code, I wanted to show uh, this is basically a class with two services, uh, where service full calls service bar. You see that bar just returns a string, but when I call the service, it returns a promise. Uh, Studio will encapsulate this for me. And basically, I require Studio. I, the second line, it's gathering uh, reference to all service on the project. And you can see we can take uh, a reference to all services before creating the service, because when I distribute in our code, I, I can't deal with uh, ordering. And so Studio does the, the, the magic of finding the service. And I will be calling this service full every second on the final quiz. And so I will show you. I wish it was bigger. But. So basically, I'm just showing you the code. Uh, now, when I run in the terminal, I don't know if you can read. Sorry for this. <laughs> It basically says success and printing full bar message, which the message was sent by the other service as we expect. This is easy because this was just one process running. But now I'll show you how can I clusterize. I just added two lines of code. The first to require the plugin, the cluster plugin, and the second saying just use the Studio Cluster plugin. And I removed the bar service from there and created another file using also the Studio Cluster, and with just the bar implementation, this is the only change that I made. And now I can run. You see I'm running index full, which is just the, the process without the bar method. And they will try to call, and I receive a, an error. I can find this out. But when I start the index bar on JS, and when I go back, now it can find. And I can keep stopping. 
I was stopping all the index bar, and they stopped to find, and I kind of start, and I can keep doing these things the whole day. They just keep finding each other no matter what I do. I can even turn off the internet connection and turn on again, and they will find again. And this is basically how the Studio Cluster works, but I wanted to show you a, a, one more video because I said that a lot of plugins, and one of the plugins that I really like, it's the plugin to gather real-time usage metrics. So I'll show you the same code, but just using the, the plugin to gather usage metrics, which basically these three lines of code here. And what I do is every time that I execute a, a service, print the time it takes to execute this service. So, and I'm in a cluster. So when I show this to you, just showing the code, I made the same thing in the index bar. And now when I run full, it still can find the, the service, but I can see the time it took to run. One millisecond, zero, and then I can just print it. So you can use this to send to a StatsD or any Grafana dashboard to gather your usage metrics. And re it's really cool because with just three lines of code, you have your whole application monitored with this. So uh, here you can see the, the links for GitHub, for Studio and Studio Cluster. Um, after the presentation, you can ask me questions in English or in Spanish. I can understand Spanish if you talk slowly. <laughs> and I can try to speak in Spanish too, but I'm not really confident speaking Spanish. And this is it, guys. Thank you for your time. Thanks for the organization. If you need to contact me, please do.